presentation. That was a really good presentation, Marsha. Really nice slides. Alrighty. Um, can I start whenever? Yes. Alrighty. All right, hello everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew, and in this presentation, I'm going to be walking you through the research uh, I did as a part of my Masters of Medical Physics with my supervisors, Mashid and Petrin. My project's titled Determination of Optimal Treatment Planning Method for Volumetric Modulated Arc Therapy, or VMAP, of lung cancers using 3D printing techniques. Now, before I get into the main background material for this project, I just want to go over some of the context, motivation, and a general aim to help frame the project and its scope. I'll revisit the aim later on after I've gone through the background material and make it more specific. So at the time of this project's commencement, uh, the hospital here, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, didn't offer VMAP for lung cancer patients. Radiation oncology team at Sir Charles Gardner would like to eventually treat lung cancer patients using SBRT or stereotactic body radiotherapy uh, with VMAP. So the motivation for this project is that it plays an integral role in the clinical implementation of VMAP for lung cancer patients at Sir Charles Gardner. It also provides a framework for transitioning to a hyperfractionated radiotherapy technique like SBRT. The general aim for this project was to determine the optimal treatment planning method for VMAT lung to be used clinically at Sir Charles Gardner. So starting off with some data, this is from a 2020 study taken across 185 countries and 36 different cancer sites. You can see that lung cancer has the second highest incidence rate of all cancers and the highest mortality rate. Looking at some more relevant data from um, the Cancer Council website of Australia, 12,000 Australians are diagnosed with lung cancer every year, making it the fifth most common cancer in Australia. It's responsible for around one in every five cancer deaths. If we take a look at age standardized rates across time, we can see an improvement in the handling of lung cancer. So this figure here shows age standardized incidence rates across time. So for people uh, in general, you can see a gradual or slight decline over time in incidence rates. But if we look at mortality rates, you'll see a more significant decline over time. So this indicates better treatment uh, and just handling in general of lung cancer, which is reflected in these five year relative survival rates uh, over time. So lung cancer can be classified in two main categories, non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. So non-small cell lung cancer makes up around 85% of lung cancer cases. And the, this is one of the factors uh, in deciding the standard treatment option. The other one is the tumor staging. So this uses the uh, TNM definition, so the tumor extent and size, nodal involvement and amount of metastases. Um, and based off these things, the tumor can be staged and a standard treatment option defined. So you don't have to be able to read uh, exactly what's in this table. But as you can see, there's a very long list of the different stages and standard treatment options available. So this project will focus its scope on early stage non-small cell lung cancer. And for that, surgery is the standard of care for most patients. It results in five-year survival rates of around 60 to 70 percent. Patients that are deemed medically inoperable for surgery uh, are offered radiotherapy as a therapeutic alternative. And historically, conventional radiotherapy was offered. However, it resulted in poor treatment outcomes, often not better than if the patient just hadn't been treated at all. However, technological advances have enabled extremely conformal treatment techniques with intensity modulated beams like VMAT, as well as more biologically effective fractionation schedules and techniques like SBRT. And as such, SBRT is now widely accepted as an effective alternative to surgery for medically inoperable patients. So just to give some evidence to back up these claims, uh, this is the first randomized phase two trial to prospectively compare patient outcomes for SBRT and 3D CRT. 102 patients were randomly assigned to either receive SBRT or 3D CRT, and you can see the fractionation schedules uh, here, 66 gray over three fractions, which is really high uh, for SBR SBRT, and then 70 gray over 35 fractions for 3D CRT found no difference or no significant difference in progression-free survival and overall survival. However, a tendency of improved disease uh, control rates and a higher quality of life was seen in the SBRT group. And keep in mind, this is despite the fact that the SBRT group contained more patients with T2 tumors and more male patients, and these are both negative prognostic factors. 
Also, the treatment duration for SBRT is only one week versus seven weeks for 3D CRT, so that's another benefit of SBRT. And this is a second trial, uh, the CHISEL trial, taken across 11 hospitals in Australia and four in New Zealand. It's a randomized phase three trial to prospectively compare uh, patient outcomes of SBRT and 3D CRT. In this trial, 101 patients were randomly assigned to either receive SBRT or 3D CRT, and you can see slightly different fractionation schedules, uh, and the two different ones in 3D CRT were just dependent on the institution. And in this trial, they found superior local control without any increase in major toxicity in the SBRT group. And after follow-up, local progression was seen in about 14% of SBRT patients compared to the 31% of 3D CRT patients. And the benefits of SBRT can mainly be put down to these three main factors, the large doses that are used per fraction, the extremely tight margins and small fields that are used, uh, which are all enabled by the motion management and image guided radiotherapy techniques that are used in SBRT. So when treatment planning for any kind of lung cancer, there's a few difficulties with modeling dose to the lung tumor. The first one is the heterogeneity in density. So modeling dose to a high density tumor that's surrounded by that low density lung tissue is a complicated task for the treatment planning system. And its accuracy is dependent on the dose calculation algorithm used. So for example, this is a large factor when using simpler pencil beam algorithms, but it's minimized with more complicated superposition convolution algorithms, or the algorithm we used in this project, uh, deterministic, deterministic solver such as uh, Eclipse's ACROS XB. So the second difficulty of modeling dose to lung tumors is the intrafraction tumor motion, which is caused by movement of the lung during respiration. This can be up to 35 mils in the soup imp direction. It's usually less like 10 to 20 millimeters. And it has to be considered during patient data acquisition and in protocols for treatment planning. So this means uh, consideration on the choice of imaging modality, and then also um, the image set to use when planning. So taking a closer look at uh, treatment planning for lung cancer and the workflow. First of all, uh, you need patient data acquisition for contouring dose calculation and patient setup. It needs to be able to capture the extent of the tumor motion and provide accurate physical information such as electron density values for accurate dose calculation. And for this, 40 CT is the gold standard. Next is target volume and normal tissue delineation for contouring. An appropriate choice of data set uh, for contouring, the tumor and organs at risk must be made, as well as protocols for target volume delineation. Lastly, we have plan optimization, dose calculation, and then evaluation of the plan. So this involves generating the plan through inverse treatment planning like VMAP, and calculating the dose distribution and evaluating the plan quality using something like dose volume histograms or planning matrices. So taking a look at 40 CT and generation of image sets, just for those who aren't familiar with the process, so this particular setup and solution is Varian solution. There are other vendors that offer other solutions, but in this setup, the patient sits uh, or lays on the CT bed with a reflective marker on their chest. And as they breathe, the position of this marker is tracked by an infrared camera. The position of this marker over time is plotted on a graph and the images taken from the CT are binned into distinct phases along this respiratory cycle. So this schematic only shows four separate phases, but there's typically 10, uh, and that forms your 40 CT, as you can see in this GIF on the right. So from this 40 CT, single 3D images can be generated, such as the maximum intensity projection set, or MAXIP. This captures the maximum intensity projection, uh, or pixels, from all phases of the 40 CT. So it can give you information about the extent of the tumor motion and organ motion. And then you can create an average intensity projection set or AVIP set, which is the average of the pixel values from all phases of the 40 CT. So you can kind of think of that as like a probability map of where the tumor is most likely to be. So looking at uh, target volume delineation or contouring, various methods exist for delineating target volumes. And if motion management techniques aren't used during treatment, the most common one is as follows. So starting with the 40 CT, uh, you generate the AVIP set and MAXIP set. On the AVIP set, the GTV is contoured on each slice, and then on the MAXIP set, the ITV is contoured. That ITV is then copied across to the AVIP set, 
and a PTB is added as a geometric expansion of around five millimeters. And this is the kind of structure that you're left with. Uh, the dark areas represent higher density where the tumor uh, is more often because this is on the average uh, intensity projection set. Now, the problem with planning uh, in this method is that the treatment planning system will increase uh, photon fluence to these low density regions to achieve dose coverage. Now, since Compton interaction, uh, which is the dominant interaction uh, for photons in tissue at MV energies, is directly proportional to the electron density, uh, movement of this higher density GTV or tumor causes the dose to follow. So when it goes into these regions of really high fluence, uh, you have much more Compton interaction, secondary electrons and dose deposition in those areas. And so that results in higher dose to the GTV than necessary but more importantly, higher dose to the surrounding normal healthy tissue. And this hinders the main goal of radiotherapy to maximize that tumor dose and minimize dose to healthy tissue. So a novel planning method has been introduced to, uh, and it has been shown to more accurately model dose compared to this conventional method. So it makes use of density overrides within the target volumes. The contouring method is exactly the same as before, but now the ITV area is overridden to uh, the average uh, density or average HU value of the GTV, and then the PTV expansion is overridden to a, a value between that of lung and tumor. So we've used negative 200 HU uh, from results of the previous study, which I'll go into in this next slide. So this study uh, by Wien et al. 2014 created VMAP plans on a number of different image sets, free breathing scans, time average scans, free breathing scans with an ITV override, the same thing but with the PTV override and then finally hybrid density override as I just mentioned in the previous slides. So the plans were delivered to a 4D phantom, respiratory phantom, dose was measured with radiochromic film and compared to the plan dose. So this table summarizes the main features of this study and some of the main outcomes. So you'll notice that uh, in terms of the respiratory motion used in the phantom, a number of different patterns were used. Uh, but no matter which pattern was used, the hybrid density override method showed better agreement between the planned and measured dose. Uh, so for all these patterns um, versus all these different planning methods. The second thing to note is the algorithm that was used. So they used triple A, um, which is different from the one in this project, which is ACROS XB. And then the, the final thing to, to note um, is the fact that they didn't use a stationary film. Uh, which I'll get back to in, in a few slides from now and outline some of the problems with that and how this project's different to this paper. So revisiting the aim now, we've covered most of the background material, getting more specific. Uh, the aim is to determine which treatment planning method out of this conventional method, this average method uh, versus the hybrid density override method, produces the most dosimetrically accurate plans uh, through point and plane dose verification with uh, ionization chamber and radiochromic film measurements. The phantom we used in the study is the quasar respiratory motion phantom. It features this uh, acrylic body which encompasses the com this commercial lung insert. So the acrylic body is roughly water equivalent and this lung insert is uh, driven in the soup inf plane or soup inf axis by this motor. Um, and the coordinate system I'm using for reference is in this top right hand corner. So the lung insert moves in the super inf. This vertical stage moves in the interior posterior direction to simulate the patient's chest during breathing, the 40 CT and so on. Taking a close look at that lung insert, uh, you can see it opens up the middle to show this plastic ball tumor and has a place for film. Now, the problem with using this commercial uh, insert is the measured dose distribution will be blurred compared to that of the treatment planning system because the film moves with the lung and tumor. So the first step in this project was designing a film holder and fixation system to keep that still. So this is the whole entire phantom design and fabrication workflow. I'll go through step by step, starting off the design of that film holder. So as you can see, as I mentioned before, it's a system that allows for the radiochromic film to stay stationary. Uh, it goes in the middle of these two um, segments of the, the film holder. This is just a CAD model. This is the fixation system which screws into the film holder and fixes it to the uh, phantom. So after designing that, the next step was to create the internal structure of the lung to be placed into the inserts. And this was done by taking freely available DICOM data uh, from an archive, archive on the internet, importing it into 3D Slicer, 
segmenting uh, one of the lobes of the lung, importing that into Mesh Mixer for manual editing, where we got I got this uh, region of bronchies, which I'm finally imported into Fusion 360 to combine with a sphere that was to represent um, the tumor. So you can see the final model in this picture. So the next step was actually creating those custom inserts, uh, lung inserts in Fusion 360. This is the CAD model for the lung insert uh, for radiochromic film measurements. You can see the gap in the middle um, for the film holder where it sits. And then in these gaps, the bronchies are placed. And then this is the CAD model of the lung insert for point dose measurements. Uh, there's a space for the tumor and ionization chamber holder to sit. This is just a cross section through the middle showing one half of it. And you can see how the ionization chamber sits at the very center of the tumor. So this is a quick video showing the setup for film measurements. The slide is taken off. The film holder is then assembled with the film inside, placed into the phantom. The lung inserts put over the top. The fixation system keeps the holder onto the phantom. The slider is then put back on the phantom, attached to the insert, and you can see the breathing motion of, of the phantom after that. That was before printing out the inserts and all the other parts, the density that most um, closely represents that of lung had to be determined. So to do that, we printed a number of different cubes with varying infill from 5 to 35 percent. These were CT scanned and analyzed. So just a very quick background in 3D printing for those that aren't aware. The infill parameter lets you change how much plastic and air you have in the internal volume of, of, your, of your cube or of your structure. So in this diagram, we can see increasing infill from 5 to 25%. So these were analyzed in 3D slicer. The average HU was determined for each of the cubes. That was plotted against the infill percentage. And then so the optimal infill percentage uh, was obtained for lung density and used for printing all the inserts. And so that's the final two steps was printing of all the parts and post-processing. Uh, these are the, this is one of the 3D printed film holders. Um, this is the insert, so this is for ionization chamber measurements, and this is for film measurements. And then this is a video of the actual phantom assembly. You can see the fixation system, the film holder with film in the middle, the lung insert with bronchies, and the 4D CT reflective marker. After the phantom was assembled, the rest of the project uh, went as follows. A 4D CT was taken of the phantom for both lung inserts. A breathing amplitude of the phantom was used uh, 14 millimeters and 14, uh, 12 cycles per minute. So after a 40 CT was taken, the AVIP and MAXIP sets were created and sent to Eclipse for treatment planning. So treatment planning was performed in Eclipse and identical uh, parameters and constraints were used uh, for both uh, methods. And just a quick reminder of those methods, the first one's planned on the AVIP set. Um, when you have this kind of variable density structure. And then the second one was contoured in the same way, but with these density overrides to the ITV and PTV. So the plans were then uh, delivered to the um, Phantom. The Phantom was set up with the tumor at the treatment ISO center on the um, treatment couch. The same respiratory amplitude and frequency was used as for imaging. Uh, and the so the yeah, each plan was delivered for both setups using the true beam linear at Sir Charles Garden Hospital. Five point dose measurements were taken with the ionization chamber, CC04 chamber, and one film measurement with film. The results were then analyzed. So the film was scanned uh, and analyzed in SNC patient. Comparison of the uh, treatment planning system and measured dose profiles were made, as well as comparison of the point dose measurements with the treatment planning system. So looking at those results, these are the results of the point dose measurements. Uh, both uh, the point dose measurements for uh, both plans were within clinically acceptable tolerances of plus or minus three percent. As you can see, there's a much larger variation for the AVIP plan. You can see that in this table. So for the individual measurements, um, these are the relative differences to the treatment planning system. You can go as low as negative 4.3 percent, as high as 3.8. And this variation can be explained by the uncontrolled starting time for irradiation with respect to the phantom respiratory cycle, the phase of that cycle. Now it's expected to average out over a large number of fractions. 
Um, and it's actually more of an important factor to consider uh, for SVRT tr treatments when there's a lower amount of fractions and this phenomenon is um, more important. So looking at some dose profiles through the central axis, this is for the AVIT plan. You can see that at the center, there's relatively good agreement with the ionization chamber between the uh, two plans. But as you get to the outside of the field, you can see that the treatment planning system underestimated dose uh, at these endpoints. If we look at the hybrid density override plan, you can see there's much better agreement throughout that whole entire profile. So this is likely due to the increased photon fluence in those low density uh, regions, causing the dose to follow when that GTP uh, enters those regions. So we can conclude that dose modeling is much more accurate in this hybrid density override plan, which supports the previous results in the literature. This is just a comparison between our results and the paper I mentioned before from we at L. So this is their uh, average planning method, the results of a dose profile through the center of that distribution. Um, you can see the same phenomena with the treatment planning system underestimating dose at the edges of the of the field. Um, and compared to the hybrid density override method where there's relatively good agreement uh, over the whole profile. Some strengths and weaknesses of this project. So uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the first paper to keep that film stationary while investigating density overrides with a dynamic respiratory phantom. This means there was no need to apply a mathematical transformation to the treatment planning system dose plane calculation to compare it with film. Uh, sometimes applying this kind of transformation is it's difficult to first of all do and then second of all understand what kind of uncertainties uh, you're imparting onto that. So the phantom also had an anthropomorphic features such as the rib, spine and heterogeneous lung inserts. However, due to time constraints, there were a few limitations such as the small number of measurements didn't permit for statistical analysis and the effect of tumor size, position and breathing parameters weren't investigated. It's also important to know that the results of this project are specific to this department due to the specific uh, algorithm used, so it doesn't generalize to other departments, um, as well as also the various planning and treatment parameters and protocols used. So to conclude, we aim to compare the dose metric accuracy of two treatment planning methods for lung cancer. The Quasar Respiratory Phantom was modified using 3D printing techniques. Heterogeneous lung inserts were created for dose measurements uh, using ionization chamber and film. Two different uh, treatment plans were created, the average conventional one and the hybrid density override one and delivered to the phantom. Point dose results showed clinically acceptable agreement uh, for both planning methods within plus or minus 3%. However, dose profiles for the central axis indicated that the treatment planning system underestimated dose at the extreme for the treatment volume for the AVIT plan, but relatively consistent for the HDO plan. So this is attributed to the treatment planning system increasing photon fluence to those low density regions, causing a large number of Compton interactions, secondary electrons, and dose, do dose deposition when the tumor entered these uh, regions. So from the results of this project, as well as various other measurements performed by the medical physics team, uh, VMAT was clinically implemented for lung cancers at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital using this hybrid density override method. In terms of future work, density overrides will be investigated for use in SPRT treatment uh, using a similar study workflow and phantom setup. The lung insert design will also be further optimized to better simulate the patient lung. So just some quick acknowledgements to end the presentation. First of all, uh, first and foremost, my supervisors, Pejman and Machine. I think everyone knows how much work these guys do, how much effort they put into everything. And this project was certainly no exception. The whole medical physics team at Sir Charles Garden Hospital, anytime they uh, were giving any insightful comments, um, namely Gabor, who helped with 40CT. Dr. Suki Gill for his support behind the scenes. Uh, Warwick and Matt for introducing me to 3D printing and teaching me the basics so long ago now. All my peers that provided insightful comments and contributed to discussions surrounding the research. And then finally, a huge thank you to them, all the members of the 3D printing research cluster that were really patient and showed a lot of support when the cluster was just first taking off and I was in some very busy times. So thank you for listening. Can I take any questions? Great, well done. Brilliant, Andrew. Thank you. Andrew, next question. Yeah, 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 I'm just seeing so, so we're going to move potentially from. Sorry, um, just ask a question. I think so. If I understand this correctly, so your film is static, 
and your lung is moving around the film based yes. on your design. So what what is that representative of in a patient anatomy? What is it? Sorry, could you repeat that? So, so if you had a patient, so yes. you're trying to kind of verify patient data. So what's that representative of like in terms of how or how would you relate that measured dose to what a patient receives? So I so the point of this was to verify the accuracy of the treatment planning system um, predictions. So in terms of the dose that the patient receives, I don't think it actually represents that. I think if you had the film moving with the tumor, then you could measure that dynamically distributed dose to the tumor, uh, which could be separate measurements uh, providing that would be very useful measurements. Uh, you know, you could provide that, that information of dose to the tumor and those areas. Uh, but if you're looking at dose um, that's not dynamically distributed to the tumour, but you're wanting to compare it to what the, the treatment planning system shows in terms of those treatment planning volumes, the PTV, ITV and so on, um, the, the film had to stay static. So I if I'm understanding the question correctly, I, I don't think it really represents the patient, the dose to the patient anatomy um, per se. Okay, cheers. So not, not exactly as if it was moving with the tumour, because that would be like the exact dynamic dose that's distributed within the tumour and the, the lung tissue area. Uh, this is not just a, not a question, but uh, some kind of comment on it. <clears throat> the main thing that, yeah, so if you put uh, the film in a normal moving phantom and we measure it, that we can uh, see what the tumour is getting, what kind of dose, what kind of dose distribution. This is one thing. If we go to the other side and we said we are interested in what the lung around the tumor is getting, then this kind of stationary film representing better. But the main right. thing, the main thing is we want to have a, a, the best planning technique because 99% of people, uh, RTs, red onks, they think what they see on the screen is what the patient is getting. Everybody knows it's not true, but but again, uh, other people accepting the plan, what they see on the screen. And yeah. with this kind of measurement, you can have a better treatment technique, which is matching better what we see, because the treatment planning system is tied to the LINAC, it's, which is not moving at all. So we see a dose wash. Uh, but if you want to compare it and really measure it, you have to keep your film stationary. So in that yeah. case, with this kind of this kind of measurement, we can choose a better technique, which is better representing the dose seen on the TPS screen yeah, exactly. and the dose delivered to the phantom and the patient. So we can reduce this kind of higher dose when the TPS try to dump dose to the lung, a lower density, and of course, higher dose is delivered there. And we can remove this kind of thing. So sparing healthy tissue, not compromising the dose coverage of the tumor. And we have a we are more confident that the, the, the dose distribution we see on the on the TPS is closer to the real dose the patient is getting, not uh, taking account, of course, setup errors, the LINAC uh, 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 modeling errors and this kind of things, but at least we know that. If the doctor accepts that those deliver, those seen on the on the TPS screen, it's 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 much much more accurate in real treatment. Yeah, than what the I patient's think, getting. I think that's one of the main points. The fact that at the end of the day, when the doctor's prescribing dose, it is to that static uh, set, um, and all the treatment planning evaluation metrics and everything is based on that. So you want to make sure that um, you're actually 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 accurately predicting what dose is deposited. Um, in that kind of reference frame. Um, but I do think Simon makes a good point in, in the sense that it would also be supplementary to be able to see if that dynamically distributed dose um, is, is what you're wanting. But I think they, they kind of go hand in hand, but this is certainly the, the method that is required to verify that trip, those treatment plans um, and make those comparisons. And as I said, you can keep the film moving with the tumor and that's actually what the other paper did. Um, as I said, they the film wasn't didn't remain stationary, and they used mathematical convolution techniques to the treatment planning system dose plane to smear it and get a blurry distribution, so it can be compared to film. But as I said, it's really difficult to kind of know the errors associated with that. They even mentioned that uh, in their paper. Um, yeah. 
So Simon, they um, decided yeah, yeah, yeah. that. So uh, I probably I won't hold on this too long, but so that the tissue, the lung tissue around the tumor isn't static. The entire lung is moving, so it, you don't just have a tumor moving up and down. The whole backing, like the entire lung, is moving. It doesn't look it, but it is. The whole thing is moving. So the OAR dose around it is also dynamic. So the the insert is moving too. So the the insert yeah, yeah. that has so the it, yeah, but I just so what I'm suggesting is that this that film is not representative of anything in the patient because the entirety of the patient moves, the whole lung moves. So I understand what you're saying if you want to look at the the dose, the delivery of the dose. Yeah, but yeah, it's just that the the patient doesn't have any part that doesn't move. But yes, you would if you wanted to then compare that. So what you would measure then is the dose which is blurred by motion. And if you wanted to see if the errors were associated with the motion, you would have to transform the motion out of your measurement. Yeah, well, they, they did it the other way around. They actually put motion into the TPS distribution. But yeah, either way. And then and yeah. then you could verify that. But yeah. So that then maybe the just the last question. I I don't know, maybe one of the questions then is what's the purpose of having a dynamic phantom if you're trying to look at a static dose? So there is no other way to, um, well, we tried to have a go with the moving film, but then Eclipse um, didn't allow us to do um, exactly the same thing that we would achieve with the moving um, phantom. So we, we, we couldn't extract the same kind of data to, to compare to. So that's the reason we didn't use the moving film and we decided to keep it so, so, that, so that the dosimeter doesn't move with the rest of the, um, the phantom. So basically our tumor and the surrounding tissue are moving, but the film is not moving and that's what you get in that plane, and that should correspond to what you see on your um, planning system. So that was the whole purpose of doing it this way, because um, we couldn't, we, if the film were moving, then we didn't have likes to compare to, if that makes sense. And, the, and to verify that the tumor is getting the correct dose, that's where we brought in the ion chamber to make sure the tumor is getting what we're thinking it gets. Right, yeah. So I, I don't know if it was, that was too clear from maybe some of my slides, but the ionization chamber did move with the um, with the tumor. Yeah, that's what the, another question I was thinking about it because yeah. um, and, and one thing before we go ahead, I think the point was which you measured with the chamber, uh, the tumor was a solid and the surrounding was a tissue, uh, the, the tissue equivalent or the lung equivalent. So, yes, so, so the, the wait, surrounding which, is. Which setup are you talking about? The ionization chamber? Yes. Yeah, so that was when I mentioned um, that we had to determine the density using those in, those cubes. So that was yeah. when it was printed, it was printed with um, a, a density or an infill that would represent that of lung surrounding it. And then the actual tumor was printed like 95, 96% infill, which represents that of solid tissue. That was just taken from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the slide. Go up, go up. Yeah, yeah. These are the slides. This is what you printed it? Uh, yes, yes. So <laughs> I forgot that is sharing. Let's see. He's down. Yes, yeah, so this one yeah, here this was one. Print, all the all the long area was printed with uh, like a, I think it was like 30, 20 to 30 percent infill now, which represented the average density of lung. Then the mm -hmm. actual tumor um, here was was printed with near 100 percent. It rep, it was basically tissue. Uh, density okay. yeah. um, okay. in, in this area here. And so you can see there's like obviously part of the ionization chamber makes up some of the tumor and like you can't avoid that. But the yeah. measurement point of that ionization chamber is right at the center of this completely solid um, mm -hmm. tumor structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Good plan. Thank you. Cool. Andrew, can I just ask one more quick thing on your slide 50? Yes three there. Can you just jump back to that one? I was trying to look at that earlier. Yes. So those peaks that you've got up, what's the kind of width of those? They're about, they five or 10 mil? 
kind of the yeah. half max of the peak. Is that just a PTV expansion? Uh, possibly, yes. So it's, um, it's the ends of the ITV plus um, ITV yeah. to PTV, yes. And what, what was the ITV to PTV? That was five mils, and that's that's the reason I asked you that question a few days ago, because um, now the um, EBQ has been reviewed, and we're thinking of changing that. Um, but normally people use larger than 0.5, um, and that's what we're working on now. But at the time of this, we went five mils extra, like from ITV to BTV, and um, the peaks include um, the ends of the ITV plus the ITV to PTV. Yeah. yeah. So it's more look like the 10 mil roughly, as you see from that's roughly, right. roughly 10 mil. Yes. But if you're like full, yeah, full width, half max, that kind of thing. So one or final question then, mm -hmm. what do you think the accuracy in setting up your phantom is compared to setting up a patient? So we do daily CBCTs for our patients. Um, yeah, I don't believe course. we used a CBCT for the phantom, right? No, we didn't. that was set up because there's markings on the phantom um, to indicate the ISA center. So I, did, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had experience setting up the patient, but I, I imagine it yeah, so may, yeah, I guess not be. So maybe to, to try and clarify that question just a little bit more. Do you think if you were working out the PTV that you need for a patient versus the PTV that you actually would need to treat a phantom, do you think they would be the same? Or? Right, OK. Um, no, well, the the phantom wouldn't move around once you've, you've put it on the, on the bed, apart from the actual respiratory motion. Um, and so you wouldn't have as large setup errors as for a patient. Um, so I guess it wouldn't have to be as as big um, as for a patient. Yeah, so I wonder if what's happening here is the fact that you can set up your phantom very accurately. So you're seeing motion of the target within the ITV range, but it doesn't really extend into the PTV range. And therefore you're seeing hot peaks at either end of that profile. Whereas if right. you had a patient, you to might be, need to, to account be... for the fact that sometimes the tissue is getting into those end regions, those shoulder parameter volumes. Yeah. And if your yeah. physical, if your high density target made its way into those areas, that would curve off that film. If sorry, if 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 the high density target went into the um, regions it, of the PTV, you say. So what you what you probably see is that your actual high density region on your phantom is moving between plus or minus twenty millimeters on that yes. x axis. Yes. Which is why it's quite flat there, and then you've got a ten mil border at either side, which is your PTV. Yes. And what you're seeing is that because you can set up your phantom extremely accurately and reproducibly your target's not extending into that edge. So you're seeing a hot area because there's but no why, but wouldn't, high wouldn't density that, material. But why would it be a hot area if it, because if it did extend into that edge, that's an area of like increased photon fluence though, isn't it? Because in the lung uh, is a lower density region, so there's higher photon fluence there. So I thought if the target actually did happen to go into that area, it would be even greater overdose of. No, um, I understand yeah. you, Simon. You're saying that in reality there may be um, inaccuracies in the setup, and that that the patient could so, breathe differently, so it the target could yeah. go there, and we don't have those uh, peaks in reality. Well, um, in reality, you would need to cover your PTP because it might be that although every time yes. your phantom moves between plus minus twenty, sometimes your patient might be moving between zero and forty, and I. Th think that would reduce your film dose from the extra attenuation. It'd be it'd be interesting to investigate that. I mean, that'd be pretty easy just to off this, offset the phantom for a few measurements. Look at the different distributions. Because I, um, yeah, I think, I, I just wonder if in that situation, you would still maintain coverage of your target on that average intensity plan, but on your HDO plan, you potentially lose some coverage if you're well, you probably you probably still have coverage on that one. 
Anyway, I'm probably going a bit off topic here. That's <laughs> no, right. that's, I mean, that's actually interesting quite points. interesting. Yes, I hope we have a relocation type of phantom to move. So for, for because we are treating in 30 fractions, if some days there is less, some days there is more, we, we were hoping that it the errors blur out each other and overall they get a flat uh, distribution. That was the idea. So it means we are not treating the hypo vaccination. Sorry, what are we doing? Uh, I'm saying we are not using the hypo vaccination like um, Five gray or ten gray. No, no, no. We are only delivering two grays per fraction for thirty ah, okay. fractions. So um, because it's a lot of fractions, we are hoping that those kinds of uncertainties blur out each other. Yeah, average out. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Great. Any other questions, Martin? Probably you have questions. Yeah. Yeah, you've been hammered pretty hard already. Um, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I was just wondering, so what you're doing basically is you, you're planning to an average of a 4 CT, and the only way to va validate that dose calculation is to basically deliver that average, uh, deliver to something that represents that average, which is the moving phantom, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Might an alternative be to actually print the average? Print the average density mm -hmm. of... Like make print another phantom, which is the average. Oh, that's good idea. We never thought yeah. of that. <laughs> yes, brilliant. Well done. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, would that be the, the equivalent? Um, printing the printing the average and keeping it stationary. Yeah, yeah I think this is look like. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't see why not. <laughs> I don't know how I would do that. You're the, you're the expert. But, I mean, that's a, that's a really cool idea. Yeah, I, I don't know how I'd do that. Maybe in, in process slicer with some different spheres of different infill. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. I think it probably would be equivalent. Yeah. And then you can compare with the hybrid ones and then it will give you a bit more clear picture, I think. That's a like brilliant this, idea, uh, Adam. I feel like the question section is just like a planning for PhD. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> to do list. Yeah. That's right. This this topic is a very challenging topic. So one of the most um, challenging in medical physics is tumor management, especially in lung cancer. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of papers that have want to tackle that. So. Any other questions from Andrew? Uh, just another thing to the to-do list. Other one could be like put a film, move it with the phantom in the normal way, deliver the dose. And the other one is just getting the plan uh, and recalculate to all the 10 for the city phases. Yeah, Expo yeah. Export the dose, export the dose, find where is the center of the tumor. And for that point, add all the those together and compare the two. Um, Gobor, I tried that, and uh, there are some difficulties with that in Eclipse. Um, in um, the way you need to analyze it, yeah, I've I've tried that. It it didn't work. But yes, in theory, you're right. I'm not even sure how well that works because that assumes that that still assumes a static calculation. So you don't have. So if you sum you, up the problem with the interplay effect is that you move between it's the motion of so, you know, solid tissue at the similar frequencies to the motion of the mlcs so if you assume a constant delivery each of the 10 phases that isn't the same as the motion varying at the same frequency as the mlcs so what, what you have or what you're having i mean the initial concerns years ago about the interplay effect is that as your MLCs move, your kind of target stays hidden for the whole thing because it's moving at the same frequency as the MLCs and stays hidden behind it. But that won't show up in a calculation on different phases because in each phase it will be visible sometimes. Yes. So to address that, we have tried to make it, make plans that are um, uh, quite a, a little modulated. So um, we have used a lot of smoothing. Um, the average shape controller is on high, and um, that um, 
we have done something else. Oh, the, the minus 200 that we are assigning to around the ITV, uh, like between ITV and PTV, um, that helps with um, keeping the modulation minimal. Because if you go from ITV, which is given a density, to like normal long, then it will cause the plan to be a bit more difficult. Um, so um, to address that, we have that minus 200 around it, so that it's a gradual change and it all happens to have the MLCs all opened up a little bit. And um, we don't, we, we get the minimum modulation um, for these plants so that we minimize the interplay effect. I was just thinking I, I should probably go to work soon. <laughs> I didn't expect. It. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Brilliant. Any other questions? I think it was enough questions. From <laughs> Andrew, thanks very much, Andrew. So just I forgot to say, Andrew and Marshall both uh, prepared a draft of paper. Uh, probably Andrew two papers. One literature review, partially accepted in frontiers in oncology. This is a great journal, and uh, Marsha is planning to submit a paper to probably radiation measurements. So, which is Q1 journal, and for Andrew as well, so Q1 journal. All the best for both of you. This semester, we have four masters, uh, final presentation, final thesis. They, the four, send a draft of publications to or preparing the draft publication for. Them. The, the um, results to be published. So, it's a great achievement for the masters this semester. Any other points, comments? All good. Thanks, Broderick, and thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Marshall. If you can please, Broderick, start, start, stop recording that. Great. Okay.